Um, so I'd like to talk to you folks today about the relationship between design and technology. In particular, the connection between concept and execution. We've seen some great examples over the last few days of designers embracing and pushing technology. And I'm going to tell you a few stories from the past, put them in the larger context. What you'll see are designers who ship, who seek not only to understand their medium, as a sculptor must understand her clay, but to engage in the messy reality of implementation. My name is Tim McCoy, and I run the product design practice at Pivotal Labs. We're a software design and development consultancy with 12 offices in three countries. We're a child and parent of Pivotal. It's a long story, better told over cocktails. You can find me after. My job is to help our designers, product managers, and developers integrate their approaches to bring software to life. In the field of software, designers and developers are too often at odds. And I believe that this classic disconnect between design and engineering and software is a historical anomaly, and that we're approaching a convergence that will put us back on track. To get there, we need more designers who understand the technical underpinnings of their work, and more engineers who recognize the transformative power of theirs. More people like those I'm about to discuss with you. So you see here is a typeface by Nicholas Jensen from the year 1475. Type designers of his day needed not only an understanding of the typographic principles, Jensen was trained as a goldsmith and was well versed in the physical and uh, properties of metal type, and this allowed him to more fully express his designs. Mm -hmm. At the same time, his experience as a printer showed him the limitations of the printed page, given the qualities of inks and paper in use at the time. You note that Jensen's letter forms show little variation in weight and lack crisp edges or small details. Surely he could have designed and even forged type with these qualities, but the implementation layer couldn't handle the fidelity. And knowing those constraints, Jensen worked within them to produce beautiful, clear, and simple type. One of the beautiful, most pretty print of his age. We fast forward to 1757. This is a specimen from John Baskerville. Baskerville was a, cal a calligrapher who sought to bring a writerly aesthetic to print. He experimented with custom inks, developed finer papers, and designed the presses to enable his material to kind of the, de the detail in his work to show through. And the thing was, the ink formulas and printing methods that he was working with were closely guarded by rival printers. And Baskerville would follow them through the streets of Birmingham, England to track their purchases so that he could kind of deconstruct and understand and learn their ways. It really, it was the Georgian era version of view source. So let's move on to 1938, Racine, Wisconsin. This is Frank Lloyd Wright's. Johnson, uh, Johnson Wax Building. It's a great room in the center of the space. Wright is nearing the end of a long career pushing the boundaries of modern architecture and construction techniques. His design for a large interior space flooded with natural light depended on novel use of reinforced concrete columns that tapered just nine inches at the base. These columns would each need to bear six tons of weight, and local building inspectors were unconvinced of their performance. So Wright built a prototype. He had a single column built and invited inspectors and the press to watch as he piled 12 tons of sand, twice the required load, onto his MVP structure. Assured of the success, he continued to the 60 tons that you see here before that column finally gave way. Now, Sometimes design can push technology until it breaks. In this building, we also see examples of Wright's stubborn adherence to his vision over the practicalities of implementation and use. He had a habit of using unproven techniques, releasing to production what really should have still been in beta. For example, rather than relying on more conventional alternatives, 
The roof and windows in this building were layers of Pyrex rods bonded together for a translucent glowing effect. However beautiful, the roof leaked and overheated the building on summer days. He was actually forced to release a firmware update that added shaded canopies and supplementary electric lighting. Wright also designed the furniture, which remarkably is still in use in the building today. This is a rare example of, 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 a, of a work that persists in its original form of, of use. But, but the chairs had just three legs. It was a function intended to help with the posture of workers, right? But in an early example of user testing to expose a bad idea, the company president, Hib Johnson, he invited Wright and Entity, had him sit down on one of the chairs and asked him to reach for something that was you know, just beyond his reach. And Wright did and promptly fell off out of his chair, dusted himself off, got up and agreed to deliver a four-legged model. <laughs> Speaking of chairs, the Bauhaus School was founded by Walter Gropius in 1919 with the slogan, Art into Industry. Its mission was to bring to mass production the creativity and design being lost in the transition from craftsmanship models of manufacturing. This is a Cheska chair by Marcel Breuer. Does anyone have one of these? Yeah, that's, absolutely, hands go up. It's simple, functional, and unapologetically industrial. Breuer's design engages his material on its own terms. His understanding of the techniques and limitations of large-scale manufacturing resulted in this iconic piece, which has become one of the most common chairs in the world. These are a few of the many fine logos by graphic designer Paul Rand, active from the 1950s to 90s. His work is known for its bold geometric forms and playful simplicity. Rand often spoke of design as the embodiment of form and function, the integration of the beautiful and the useful. In developing an identity, Rand understood how Mark would be applied and deployed. The UPS logo had to work as an embroidered patch and remain legible when shipping labels were mutilated in transit. IBM's famous logotype came in 8-bar, as you see here, and 12-bar versions, the latter for finer applications like executive business cards, places that could handle that additional detail and it would be more bespoke for it. I think that unless the thing is practical, it's not art, he says. The art comes in the ingenuity of a designer who is able to, in a way, conceal art as a service to business. The guy who can make, really make it work is the real artist. When the Atari 2600 was released in 1977, it was just barely powerful enough for games like Pong and Combat. Yet it was in production for over 15 years and came to feature far more advanced games for their time, like Pitfall and Yars Revenge, on the same hardware. Game designers achieved this by exploiting the limitations of the platform itself, using the lack of a frame buffer to redraw sprites multiple times during the electron beam's pass of the screen, introducing a black bar along the left side of the playfield to extend the processing time available for non-drawing functions of the application. Elongating the ball sprite, one of the few drawing tools available to games, and repurposing it as a rope. These were crazy hacks. And they allowed designers and developers to push each other and to push the limits of what they could achieve. It kind of reminds me of this. Who knows what this is? Does it look terribly familiar to anyone? Wow, very few. A little older than I think. Um, it was 1996, and I was building websites by print designers, making the transition from digital. Uh, to digital from, from print. It was a strange time where the people designing the product truly didn't understand its means of production. And worse, they had false assumptions because of the tools they used in their own process. Much of my time 
was spent talking designers to all the reasons their beautiful mock-ups just couldn't be implemented. Instead of the freeform canvas of physical paste-ups or Photoshop, all I had to work with was HTML intended to display paragraphs of text and tabular data. For web designers of a certain age, the thought of manipulating these columns and rows and call spans and cell padding, cutting your assets just right, to coax browsers into rendering complex layouts elicits a mixture of pride and rage. <laughs> Fortunately, we've come a long way since then. There are many design-friendly frameworks and development tools where designers can once again experiment directly in the medium of implementation, where we can learn what's possible and let it influence the experiences we can deliver, where we can envision the impossible and help to develop the tools to make it so. At Pivotal Labs, we do this every day through pairing. Designers and developers working side by side to ship working software. We developed live style guides, co-owned by developers and designers. With it, we can see the effects of our design decisions in real time, centralized layout control. When designing with data, libraries like D3 let us play with real information and account for situations where the graph doesn't go neatly up and to the right. I tell you a million stories about the designs for the data visualizations that look great in Photoshop. Uh, you know, but we're also tearing developers away from their keyboards to join designers and PMs in user research and sketching sessions so that they can understand user needs and look for ways to push the technology to support them. There remains a gap between what we can imagine and what we deliver. A big theme I'm taking away from this conference is that the distance of that gap is shrinking. As designers and technologists, we owe it to ourselves and to the people who use our products to reach for that convergence, that state of symbiosis. Thank you.